The question that I want us to think about today is, what is the difference between 20 and 24 million? Now, those are both estimates from the Congressional Budget Office and others on the number of people that might lose health insurance if the Affordable Care Act is repealed. One way to answer the question is simple. It's four million. That's a huge number. It means that potentially four million people's lives hang in the balance between those two estimates. Another way to answer the question is zero. There is no difference between 20 and 24 million, just as there's no difference between 10 and 20 and 30 million. And I say that because those numbers are too large. They're too abstract for our minds to meaningfully grasp. That's not the way people think. That's not the way people reason. That's certainly not what moves people to action on the behalf of others. And so, on a policy level, on a political level, on a public health level, there's very little difference in the motivational force, the kind of impetus for people to do something new or to try something differently between 20 and 24 million. So you might say that the mathematical delta between 20 and 24 is four, but the motivational delta is close to zero. So today, I want to argue that the truth lies somewhere in between those two answers. The truth is somewhere between the obvious and the relatively straightforward answer of four million, and the less obvious, the more provocative answer of zero. Because numbers are, of course, important, but numbers are just numbers until we give them life. They have to be put in the right context for them to have real-world impact. We have to know, we have to feel the lives of the people who are affected by a particular treatment or by a particular policy. And that might seem like an obvious point. It's because it is. There's nothing new, there's nothing novel about what I'm saying. In fact, the idea that stories can be used to create change is one of the most ancient insights that we have. But it's also one that we in academia, we don't use effectively enough. We can do a better job of reaching people, whether they're clinicians or patients, funders, policymakers, in new and interesting and more compelling ways. So we in academia, we're good at generating new knowledge. And that part is vital. That part is sacred. Without good evidence, without good data, we have no idea what we're doing. But also important is the synthesis and the dissemination of that information. Our research, our statistics, they have to be infused with narrative and story. And I think that is especially true today, at a time of tremendous change in our health system, tremendous change in our country. So whatever your views are of the last presidential election, I think what's obvious is that people didn't necessarily vote based on facts or policy or character or even temperament. People bought into a particular narrative, a particular story about what was going on in the world around them, and that is ultimately what carried the day. And so I think we in academia, we in medicine, we can use this insight as well. We can take the knowledge that we produce and we can tell a story around it to make sure it has the type of impact that we want it to have. I use narrative here in two senses. The first is the use of human narrative. That's our stories, our colleagues' stories, patients' stories, family stories. Those are real human <coughs> stories. But the second part of this is tying those stories to a larger narrative about who we are as a health system, who we are as a country. What values do we hold dear? How do the lives of clinicians, how do the lives of patients fit into that larger narrative? I think the first thing to recognize is that communicating about science is hard. Science is, by its very nature, messy. It's constantly being challenged. It's constantly being overturned. 
Sometimes talking about new science can seem something like this, where everything we eat both causes and also prevents cancer. You need somewhere between five and 10 servings of fruits and vegetables to either live a long life or not to live a long life. And that kind of uncertainty, that kind of constant evolution can make it hard to communicate directly, can make it hard to communicate forcefully about issues in science. One recent study found that half of new studies that are covered by newspapers are later overturned or proven to be wrong by subsequent meta-analyses. And stories that get more coverage are more likely to be overturned. And I should note that this study itself got a lot of media coverage, so I'm not sure what that says about the validity of this study. But I think the larger point is a good one, is that when things are constantly changing, when they're constantly evolving, it's hard to talk about them. The second point is that we in medicine tend to talk in statistics, but most people tend to think in stories. In medicine, we tend to avoid the use of anecdote, and that is entirely appropriate most of the time. One of the goals of evidence-based medicine is to use evidence and not anecdote to drive decisions about treatment, to drive decisions about diagnostics. But I do think that there's an important distinction to be made between using anecdote to justify a particular practice and using anecdote to explain or promote a practice that's already rooted in data. So you wouldn't want to use a collection of anecdotes to make policy decisions, but you might want to use a collection of anecdotes to advocate for a particular policy position that's already rooted in data. And it's important not to get those two things confused. The third issue that makes science hard to communicate about is that the language of science and the language of medicine is very different than the language of advocacy, the, very, the language of politics. And so, once again, that's entirely reasonable. Scientific writing is appropriately nuanced. It's appropriately cautious. We say things like X may be associated with Y, or we found a small signal towards Z. But that's very different than how most people communicate. As you can see here, I have no idea what these guys want, but they're being very direct about it. And sometimes I think we need to be more direct about the way we talk about these issues as well. <clears throat> the larger problem, however, is that even on issues of established science, there are huge discrepancies between what science knows and what the general public believes. And unfortunately, these discrepancies seem to be getting larger over time. So almost all scientists, 98% of scientists, believe that humans have evolved over time. But only two-thirds of the general population feels the same way. 86% of scientists believe that all children should be vaccinated against vaccine-preventable diseases. Only 70% of U.S. adults feel that way. 90% of scientists think that human activity is contributing to global climate change. But only 50%, only half of the U.S. population feels the same way. And there are probably many reasons for this type of discrepancy. I think there are groups of people that profit either economically or politically from spreading misinformation. But part of this is also a failure on the part of the scientific community to effectively communicate about its work. So only a third of Americans, only 31% of Americans, think that scientists are effective communicators. There are many graduate programs in science and medicine that don't offer any training on how to talk about our work to the lay public. And this is at a time that more and more public policy is rooted in science, everything from education to the environment, climate, healthcare, it's all rooted in science, but we're not taught how to talk about these issues. Increasingly, there are important domestic programs that are on the chopping block, that are at risk of losing federal funding. NASA, the EPA, the NIH, health insurance expansions. And so I think it's more important now than ever before that we speak out as a scientific community on these issues. And using stories 
to animate our research can be a really effective strategy. That's true for issues that are large and issues that are small. So whether we're talking about the risks and benefits of a particular treatment with our patients, or we want to implement a quality improvement project in a clinic, or we're advocating for some kind of policy position at the state or the federal level, using stories to animate data can be very effective. And when thinking about how to do that, there is an invaluable framework that was developed by a professor at Harvard, Professor Marshall Gans, and he teaches at the Kennedy School. He has been a community organizer for decades and is a real expert on the use of narrative to inspire change. He argues that there's three main components to any good story that inspires people to do something new. The story of self, the story of us, and the story of now. The story of self is your own story. It describes why you were called to a particular issue. What values, what experiences have led you to this point? The story of us, then, is an attempt to connect your own experiences, your own values, with the experiences and values of those around you. It's an attempt to identify who your people are, what your collective story is. And the story of now describes what challenge you're asking us to face right now. Why is it urgent? What actions are you recommending? What is your motivating vision for change? So when we're thinking about how to do this, we need to think through each of these stories, the story of self, the story of us, the story of now. And I'll just close by saying that <clears throat> whether we like it or not, we're now part of a health system that is equal parts medicine and politics and economics. And the current social climate makes it hard not to feel like our responsibilities extend beyond the classroom, beyond the clinic, beyond the hospital. And I think that's in part because as medical professionals, as doctors, nurses, pharmacists, physical therapists, we now represent an increasingly rare link in society. Doctors, for instance, are some of the most well-paid, well-educated, well-connected professionals. But we're also intimately familiar with what people are going through on the ground. We're intimately familiar with some of the most marginalized and the most disadvantaged populations. And that's not true of all professionals. It's not necessarily the case that eye bankers or management consultants are examining the feet of their diabetic patients or that they're interviewing people who are struggling with opioid addiction or alcohol use. But we do that every day. And so, if for no other reason, it's important that we tell these stories to give voice to people who don't have the opportunity to do so for themselves. And to do that effectively, we need data, and we need narrative. We need stories, and we need statistics. So tell me about the 24 million people that might lose health insurance. But tell me also about just one of them. Science, data, evidence, they are the building blocks of progress. They point the way forward. They pave the road, they build the vehicles to get us there. But stories are what move us. They're the motivational spark. They're the fuel that we pour in the engine, and they inspire us to take action for ourselves, to take action on the behalf of others. Thank you. Mm -hmm.